All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to this gathering here, and uh, welcome to the gathering online. Welcome to Hockey Night in Canada. Yes. <laughs> All right, so here we are gathering, and uh, we've uh, postponed our regularly scheduled program till for about two weeks down the road. We'll do the last S in bless at that time. But for today, I'm sure you can guess what the theme is today, so uh, we will revel in that as we get there. Um, but before we do, I just want to give a shout out to the Rachers, Gord and Linda Racher. Um, they're not here today because they're having a party for their 50th anniversary, their wedding anniversary, 50 years, so... Congratulations to them. And since I won't be here next week, I just thought I would like to say a shout out to the McDavids, to Henny and Leroy McDavid. You thought I was going to say Connor, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, also a shout out to him. But it is their 50th wedding anniversary next weekend, and I'm going to be out of town. But uh, if you see them, please be sure to uh, congratulate them next week. That'd be awesome. One last announcement, and that is um, in the newsletter that came out on Thursday, there is a online survey for church accessibility. We would like everybody and all to fill out that survey, as it would just give us a, a good understanding of your understanding about church accessibility, how easy it is for you and for anybody, and your perceptions of all that as to how they come into church. So we uh, in ask you to engage in that. And I'm going to call up the worship team at this time, and they're going to uh, lead us in a, a round of uh, praise to the Lord our God, and uh, they're going to invite you to stand as you are able, when, as long as you're able, and uh, we will be together in this place, worshiping the Lord our God. Thank you, Paul, and company. Good evening, friends. Good morning, friends, if you're, uh, if you're tuning in. Uh, later than now, I invite you to uh, to rise with us if you're able. And uh, as we begin, I want to read a couple of selections out of uh, this Bible that I have yet to replace with a large print version. I've got an appointment with my optometrist on Monday. You'll all be very excited when I show up next Saturday. I'm sure with bifocals. So, uh, uh, first from from Proverbs 18, uh, verse 10. Uh, a verse that you might be familiar with, uh, where the writer says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous one runs into it and is safe. On the topic of, of righteousness, uh, over in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, where Paul writes, And because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and, reden and redemption. So that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And the invitation for us tonight, friends, is to come boldly into this place because God has become our righteousness in Christ Jesus, in whose name we are invited to run, find strength, and be hidden, be fully sanctified and redeemed. God is great indeed. We're going to sing of his greatness now. sings 
my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Went through the world and forest glades out. my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to how great thou art, how great thou art, and when I think that God his Son not spared me, sent him to die, I scarce can take it. sing of your majesty and your wonder. God, we're moved in humility to think that you would adopt us as your children as well. Oh, 
A thousand stories of what they think you're like But I've heard tender whispers of love In the dead of night And you tell them that you're pleased And that I never alone you're good, good for to you all, to you all, to you all, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, and you know just what we need before we say a word. You're good. Good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us you are perfect you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us it's love so undeniable I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love, love oh, You're a good, good father It's who you are it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're good, good for It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To God, we know that our love only exists because you first loved us. 
just like this conversation this evening. God, you began it. You invited us here. You started this talk that we're going to have, that we're having right now. God, you invited us into this place. Just like the relationship that we have with you, your Holy Spirit invited us in. And God, we, we could not love you if you didn't love us first. So our love for you, our love for one another even, our love for, for neighbor, for the world that you've given us to love, God, all of it is evidence of your love for us. So as we sing of our love for you, God, we're so thankful that it's evidence that you love us infinitely more than we could ever say that we love you, God. God, 
our song joins creation song. We sing of your goodness and your love for us. May our praise rise to you like incense. May you find it pleasing. May you be lifted high and enthroned in the praises of your people, God. Be seated, friends. All right, you know, so. Yeah, they're super quick on the draw. It's like this guy's done. Let's let's get the let's get the cane out here. Let's there we go. So who brought who brought some food to donate, kids? For yeah, all right. Can you can you show it off? Can you? No, all right. Okay, so so when you go down, okay, there, okay, excellent. So when you go downstairs, you're gonna bring it down with you. Okay, we're good, excellent. Okay, but before you go, hang on, don't don't get crazy, don't get crazy, because what are we gonna do first? Yes, excellent. Okay, so so do you remember, kids? So so what are the adults gonna say before you head down? The Lord be with you, and then kids are gonna say. And also with you. Excellent. Thanks, big kids, for reminding the little kids. That's excellent. Okay, so adults, you're going to say it with me. Ready? So, the Lord. Okay, and kids. Oh, just amazing. Excellent. Have a great time in mess hall, friends. Take care. Those kids are having fun tonight. How many of you wish you were downstairs with the kids? A few of you. Okay. All right. You're honest. The rest of you are also honest. <laughs> Agreed. You like the break. All right. Here we are. So, I remember going with my brother to his place of worship. The parking lot was full. We parked on one of the side streets. We were walking towards the sanctuary and we joined the throng of people. Our pace was quick. We wanted to get there before it started. Entering the building, you could feel the air was thick with excitement. Catching up briefly with a few friends in the foyer, we then moved to our seats. The ushers guided us to our seats with ease. The people gathered there were wearing their Sunday best. The organ prelude began to play. First, the elders came in, then the priests. The hush grew over the crowd, waiting, waiting. And then the puck dropped, and the game had begun. Hockey. I was watching my first ever NHL game in person. <laughs> Hello out there, we're on the air, it's hockey night tonight. Tension grows, the whistle blows, and the puck goes down the ice. The goalie jumps and the players bump, and the fans all go insane. Someone roars, Bobby scores at the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Second period, where players dance with skates to flash, the home team trails behind, but they grab the puck and go bursting up and they're down across the line. They storm the trees like bumblebees, they travel like a burning flame. We see them slide the puck inside, it's a 1-1 hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name, and the best game you can name. Is the good old hockey game. Take me where hockey players face off down the rink. And the Stanley Cup is all filled up for the champs who win the drink. Now the final flick of the hockey stick and the one gigantic scream. The puck is in, the Canadians win the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game. Can name is the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey 
game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. My brother, Mike, who took me to the first game, was an avid hockey fan. You might say that he worshipped hockey. I'm sure he was influenced by watching Saturday night hockey. My brother graduated from playing church leagues to playing college hockey. And given a little bit more of a cultural opportunity, I am sure that he would have made it to the big league. But sitting there that evening at my first ever hockey game, my brother explained the hockey game to me. Mike explained the rules, and sensing that I understood them, he began to explain the plays as they happened. And I graduated from watching the puck to watching the players. The year was 1983, and Wayne Gretzky was flying around the ice like a ballerina to her own music. I am forever grateful for my brother introducing me to hockey. My induction into this spectator sport, for me, <laughs> proved very beneficial for me over the years. But i got to be honest, when I started here earlier, just before that song came on, uh, did you think I was talking about church? Did I have you going? Some? No? <laughs> All right. You know, come on, place of worship, ushers, organ playing. I mean, it would, there was a lot of clues there that could have said church, but all right. It's my, pardon? Oh, I had you. I, wow, but I always knew that I had you. <laughs> it's my opinion that, and that of many others, that hockey is a religion, not only here in Canada, but in so many north of the equator populations. Hockey is a religion, you say? Yes, hockey as a religion. Let me explain. Implicit religion has three definitive characteristics. Commitment, all-encompassing focus, and intensive concern with intended effects. Commitment. I am sure that it can be said of all sports, but there is an undeniable strong commitment between followers, hockey fans, and their religion, the sport of hockey. Many fans don't miss watching a home game, and during the regular season, watching a game is a weekly ritual. All-encompassing focus. For many avid fans, hockey is their focus. Their life revolves around hockey and the lens of life that it imparts. As for concerns and outcomes, there's no denying the effect of hockey on a fan's life. Diehard fans can be visibly upset or angry when their team does not win a game. They are down in the mouth. Or when their favorite player gets traded. <laughs> also, both affecting the fans' life and perspectives. I remember when Peter Pocklington traded, no, 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 sold Wayne Gretzky to the LA Kings. The outcry was immense. Even Wayne himself was crying on national television. And the fan base felt betrayed. Beyond these three implicit characteristics of hockey as a religion, there is a longer list of explicit characteristics that solidify the comparison and therefore the parallel. Joseph Price wrote an article about sports as popular religion, and here's what he said. He said that the common characteristics include the worship of a deity, the idea of authority, Tradition, beliefs, faithful followers, ritual sites, sacramental elements, and the sense of unity found in community. Now, as I listed these parallels between hockey and religion, I could see some of you nodding your heads in agreement. The very sport itself is the deity to be worshipped, and the stadium is the sanctuary. I remember walking into the Montreal Forum. It felt closed in, really tight, and it was humid in there. But I got a sense that that place was holy. CBC's Hockey Nights in Canada was the virtual means of tuning in to worship. They were well ahead of the virtual church that started up after the pandemic, as we know. The idea of authority? Well, I might be stretching it too far, but I think Don Cherry and Ron McLean were our favorite preacher theologians. 
And when it comes to traditions, how many of you wear your team jersey on game night? Yeah, all right. Very good. Thanks for being honest. How many of you decline, men, decline to shave during playoffs as a means of demonstrating your loyalty? Not so many. Oh, one girl. No, just kidding. <laughs> all these traditions and beliefs are practiced not just by fans, but by the players too. Some players are wearing the same socks that they wore in the last winning game. And some players put on their equipment in exactly the same manner so as not to jinx the outcome of their performance. Canada's Hockey Hall of Fame is another place of worship. Almost as if religious relics are put on display for the worshipers to remember the rituals and pray to their saints. Speaking of saints, hockey has a myriad of saints, do they not? I'm sure that a name or three has already come to your mind. Do you care to share who that name was? Who came to your mind when I said there's a saint in hockey? Who? Tim Horton. <laughs> He's memorialized. <laughs> Joe Billabo. John. Oh. Guy Lafleur. Anybody else? Gretzky. Gordie Howe. Bob Yor, McJesus, <laughs> Maurice Rocket Richard. You're giving away your age back there. <laughs> Speaking of Gordy Howe, Gord, I, I had lunch with that guy once, and he gave me an autograph, a, a photograph of him to Dale, Gordy Howe. I still have it. Or I have um, Wayne... Gretzky and Patrick Waugh cards from Upper Deck. You know the very first promo cards that came out in 1991-92? I have a set. They're, these are embossed in glass. Memorabilia. Relics. Saints. You're getting the picture. Have you ever noticed the parallel in symbolism between hockey and religion when it comes to the Stanley Cup? The Stanley Cup being the Holy Grail? Drinking from that Stanley Cup after the final game is like drinking from the Holy Grail to give you life itself. How many of you have seen that cup in person? Yep. Have you ever touched it in wonder and in awe? Okay, at the risk that all of you are thinking I'm shaming the religion of hockey, I better stop. Because in fact, I'm not shaming it, I'm just naming it. Hockey can be seen as an implicit religion because of the way that the spectators engage in the sport, which is secular. And if you want to use that word secular, but it's true. Fans engage in the sport of hockey in a very overt, explicit, religious way. And truth be told, allow me to confess, I am jealous of the fan base that hockey has. And I wish that Jesus Christ would have the same, such exuberant, demonstrative bunch of fans. Amen? Amen. Which leads me to thinking about the theology of hockey. If hockey is a religion in that it has diehard followers, then might I suggest that we pay attention to how hockey can illustrate theology. Theology. The study of God, the worldview that we have that places the triune God at the center. By now, you probably all know that I agreed to a wager with my friend and colleague, John Van Sloten, as to the outcome of this Battle of Alberta. The wager? The loser of the battle had to sing to the glory of hockey as portrayed by the winning team. Much like a friendly wager between the mayors of our fine cities, John and I were to engage in similar shaming ways of having to praise the winning team. But more to the point, we are to name the glory of hockey as demonstrated by the winning team. By the way, if you don't know, John Van Sloten is that friend of mine that I mentioned before who is quite adept at seeing the everywhere God everywhere and in everything. If you follow along in his podcasts and sermons, you'll, the whole creation would open up. That first song we sang, I'm sure he could exegete that down finely and tunely. Right, John? I'm sure you're watching, so. 
Since we won, Edmonton won the Battle of Alberta, here is John's tribute. Let's watch. Hey Dale, this is me honoring the terms of our bet slash agreement. I've just changed out the sign in front of our church and we'll be preaching on June the 5th on the sporting parable of Connor McDavid. So congratulations to you and all of your Edmontonian friends on the win. Um, to be honest, I'm kind of excited to be preaching on McDavid. Uh, he is truly otherworldly and extraordinary. And if someone's going to preach a sermon on the theology of hockey, why wouldn't you pick the best text possible? So uh, thanks for helping us get to that point. I'm not sure that we're there, and I'm not sure that at all there was any kicking motion in that goal, but we're letting go of that and want to offer our congratulations to you and everyone in your church. Seems to me that John went down kicking as well, don't you agree? So let me relay some of his insights and share with you the theology of hockey. In an article that John wrote in 2004, he quoted that theology coach by the name of John Calvin. John Calvin once wrote about a spiritual reality called the sensus divinitus, an inner awareness and compulsion towards God. Van Sloten called it a sacred homing device implanted in the soul of every human being, including hockey fans. This sense of God, John continues to describe, runs through us like a river, even though we may divert it towards other things. And updating his description, John Van Sloten would say that this sensus divinitus comes alive in us when we marvel at the acrobatic beauty of Connor McDavid exploding on the ice. Or when we sense the tremendous effort by the whole team of a bunch of ordinary guys. And yes, even in the thrill of winning the Stanley Cup and hoisting it high in the air, we too have a desire to join in. Could it be, John asks, that our expressions of these desires is really just a pointer to our more eternal yearnings? Part of an even bigger game that is being played out? I'd like to answer John's question with a resounding yes. Yes, I think we are destined for more than temporal moments of victory. Yes, our hearts long for a sustained vision of peace and victory in this life. And yes, we want to see the everywhere God everywhere, especially in our lives. And if we can just glimpse it in the feet of hockey being played out, then by golly, it must exist in more fuller forms. Here's how John spoke his yes. He says, maybe we're all just yearning for things to be the way the maker always meant them to be. Life as this amazing game lived out before and with God. Conceivably, all that is right about the exciting hockey playoff run is indicative of an even greater rightness that we are all meant to know. In essence, stating that hockey acts like an icon through which we can see God. John then goes on to imagine. We are made to experience the elation and deep soul satisfaction of a fifth game victory. Yes? We are made to have heroes who bring us to our feet screaming, yes! We are made to live with a sense of hope and anticipation about the future with a passion and joy to vivre coursing through our veins. We are made to live in real community where a honking horn is seen as a sign of camaraderie instead of antagonism, where total strangers share high fives as we all share in the pursuit of a common goal. We are made to fully engage in and enjoy this amazing game of life that we are all playing so hockey religion or not can you see god and his design for us in the game of hockey that's the question now i imagine that john is writing his message about the theology of hockey this coming week and he's preparing to preach it next sunday pentecost when the flames from heaven came down pun intended <laughs> And I imagine that John will go more into detail of how we can see God through hockey. 
John has an incredible ability to wax poetic on such insights. So here's a few insights that I learned from John. A paraphrase of Psalm 139 would read, For you, O Lord, created Connor McDavid's most inner being. You knit him together in his mother's womb. Connor's frame was not hidden from God when God made him. All of Connor's days were ordained before Connor was born. And we praise God for how fearfully and wonderfully God created Connor. And so we marvel at how well the knees in Connor work to enable him to explode on the ice. During game four, if you were watching it on television, CBC, they, they tracked him as to how fast he was skating alongside of the boards from one end to the other. 39 kilometers per hour they tracked him at. We marvel at his ability to read the game on the fly, to be trapped by four defenders, to get free and then make a great play. We watch in awe as McDavid pulls his teammates along with him as he excels. Connor's magic, causing his team to come together to play well like a team is designed to play. It is this excellence in Connor McDavid that will raise the bar in how hockey is played the same way that a prophet challenges a nation to live better. And excitement about this hockey incites the city to rally around their home team and cheer them on to victory. So yes, we can see the everywhere God everywhere and today, especially through Connor McDavid. And I would like to close on that note of the city. A city that comes together, dropping all pretenses of division that we might have had, all to rally around a common goal. It does not matter your race nor class, your gender or sexuality. It's not your politics or religion or your personality or nationality. All of that is dropped and unseen as the city comes together for their home team. I even heard an announcer say, in essence, exactly that. All divisions in our city were gone as we rallied around the team. That's what I see in hockey as a religion at the, at, at the core of its theology. A community that comes together, team and city coming together. It's amazing to consider the impact that a hockey team can have on a community. And that is what I see being a Christ follower is all about. I see a community that comes together, rallies around our central belief in a triune God who designed the world for harmony. I see a community of Christ followers with commitment to love God and love neighbors, loving people, we call it here at the river. I see a people with an all-encompassing focus to reach out to the world with love and grace, igniting faith as we go along. And our see, I see our intense concern for intended effects, that we would live into the harmony that God designed for us when he first created us. Such transformed lives that there is no denying that there is a Father in heaven who loves us. Loving people starts with Christ and leads to faith in God ignited, it, which creates an environment for lives to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. When all these three aspects of community unite, we will live out the theology of the triune God, and this world is a better place. You will feel the excitement. So here's my invitation to you. Come. Come to the unity of community found in being a Christ follower. Put on the home jersey and revel in the beauty of God's design. Come together and celebrate the oneness of Christ that is found within each and every one of us. Come and worship together the one God who is above all and in all and with all. Come and let us drop our pretense of race and class, our gender and sexuality, our politics and our traditions, our personalities and our nationalities. Come, let us be avid fans together for the Lord. Amen. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best
best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. Had to, had to get one in with some good playoff shots. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't tell Oilers.com that we have those videos. <laughs> well, friends, can we invite you to stand for, for one last song on this uh, theme of being invited into the family of God exactly as we are celebrate God's goodness There's 
Well, it has been good for us to uh, come together here this day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for reveling as well in the uh, theology of hockey. I pray that it was a blessing to you, and I pray that you are a blessing to others as you depart from this place. So there's one chant we probably should say before we part, and that is, Go Oilers, go! <laughs> are you ready? Go Oilers, go! Right on. We wish you well, Oilers. And... Um, in light of uh, John Van Sloten's theme, it seems, for his life and for his passion, and drawing again from that James 4, verse 8 passage, where we draw near unto God and he draws near to us, we pray that as you go out into the world, that as you would see the everywhere God everywhere and give praise for him. Amen. Go in his name. Mm -hmm.